All right. So tonight we'll be talking about math. <laughs> if you have your uh, speaker on, just mute that. Um, so we'll be talking about math, which can be a scary topic. So we're going to try and have as many demos in the class as possible so you can actually get some hands-on experience rather than just looking at things. We don't quite have time for the pre-class discussion because it's during class. So I'm going to review uh, a couple of comments about the presentations that I observed last week. So you can pull those up. So these are these are minor comments that I didn't want to like distract the presenter at the time. So uh, I just wrote down my comments and then we'll review them. If, if I used your data set, it wasn't a commentary on you or your presentation so much as like the general theme that I was observing. So don't get offended. Um, so I'm going to use uh, a CSV that was used a couple people. Um, and then it's this. Let's make this a little bit bigger. Right, so the the shape of the data frame, right? Nine hundred and eighty-five rows, twelve columns. And so, one little comment that's just sort of like a presentation issue is if you just type DF and like get the whole data frame back, there's a lot of content on the screen, right? And like scrolling through this, all nine hundred rows can be sort of like tedious, right? And like typically doesn't actually add a ton of value. And so um, the other alternative that I saw a few people use, and this has also been present works, is just saying print DF. I'm not sure what the motive is on that. I can speculate that um, it makes things slightly better than using the, the, the stylistic sort of printing that pandas will do by default, in that it um, prints columns that don't fit on the screen to like below the first screen. And that actually makes it also confusing. So like, to me, that is not a good solution either. It's just hard to read and a lot to scroll through. So what I advocate um, when I'm looking at uh, a data frame is to look at the head command. And so it provides you only a little bit of the data, which you can adjust if you type in, like, I think, I don't know what this is. Yeah, so you, you can change how many rows you see. And that can be sort of useful. And then there's also the, the tail command, which shows you the bottom of the data frame. So it's just a reminder, if you don't remember, those are commands that make during the data frame easier. John? One thing that's an interesting problem where I, was, I would do that, and it would just print it regularly. It wouldn't make it like, look nice or anything. Hmm. Okay. Can you reproduce that? Or is it? I can hold on to it. All right. Yeah. I'd like to see that. So. There are issues that you guys will bring up in class that I can solve and some problems that I cannot solve. I won't know this until you present. So like Ken was talking to me before class with a doctor issue. I can try and troubleshoot, but there's like I don't have all the answers. So you're welcome to ask me about IT support questions and I, I may or may not have the answer. All right. So another trick that we have up our sleeve, besides just looking at the top or bottom of the data frame is this key command. And I saw one person use that. I was pretty impressed. Basically, what that does is transpose the output. So transpose means convert all the rows to columns and the columns to rows. So basically, take your data frame, rotate 90 degrees. Why would that be useful? The answer is, if I have, if I only display the first few rows, which in this case are displayed as columns, and I have, like, say, hundreds of columns, which are now rows, this display can be sometimes easier, depending on the shape of your data frame. So I use it a lot. If, if Sometimes the CSV will have like huge long header strings, and that can get really annoying to try and read in the standard presentation format. And so if you transpose the output, it makes it a lot easier to read. So just a convenience factor again. All right, so this is, uh, so moving on. Does anyone have any questions on presentation? Those are pretty superficial questions. So the next point that I uh, sort of observed was when we load in data and it contains a bunch of NANDs, sort of like you know empty values, the first sort of reaction is, well, we'll just drop all that data, right? Like it's noisy. I don't want to clean it. We'll just drop it. And, and that may be valid if you only have a few instances of the NAND. But uh, if you have a lot, that can actually lose a significant portion of your data. All right, so I load up this Excel file. And then I have uh, 8,800 rows of data. And the number of 
non-zero entries in that, so the number of NANDs is zero. So we have no empty values, right? Good to go. Well, so actually, this is where head comes into pretty good use. You'll notice that there are some entries here that have this dash, right, which the CSV editors, the people who made the Excel spreadsheet, sorry, said to themselves, we'll just put in a little placeholder, and that'll be the empty value. So the the right thing to do, right, this is like an opinion, but the right thing in my case would be to replace the, the dash there notation with an actual NAN entry, right, so that we can really clarify it is a placeholder for an empty variable. Now we can go back and count how many of those NANs have we introduced. And we've, we've added NANs, and so how many? So it's 10,000. It sounds like a lot. But you have to remember the original shape of the data frame is pretty big. There's 97,000 cells in the data frame. So 10%, like empty values, it's not actually that bad. All right, so 10% seems reasonable. The problem is when we have some number of NANDs and we say well, we're just going to drop every row that has an empty variable in it, we'll just throw that out. That'll make the job way easier. Right? The problem with that is when we drop every row that has a NAND in it, we drop more than half the rows. So before we had 8,800, after we drop every row, there's 3,800. So that's a pretty significant loss of data. And the problem is these NANDs probably are not uniformly distributed through our data. So we, like if, let's see, if we can pick out any sort of like obvious things, like if there's a, like a, a disposition um, that's more likely for check bags, right, and we drop all the rows with hands in it, now we're introducing some bias into what our expected results are gonna be. So either, you know, go back, chase the data owner and ask what's going on, or to like try to figure out like, am I introducing some bias into the data by doing this cleaning or not? So I think that that's that's like a tricky problem to be solving in this class. I just wanted to raise it as an issue so that when you go off, you know, to your real job and you remove all the NANDs, like, and you lose half your, more than half your data, that'll be a bit of an issue. Question: NANDs and cleaning is a tough job. So does anyone have any questions on that section? Okay. Well, one thing I did is I had a quite a few columns that had a lot of NANDs, mm -hmm. and when I did the missing numbers, missing values test, and the missing values, yep. that, that showed me which columns had the NANDs, and I had to drop those columns rather than the NANDs. So, so I would say that if, that if you, so the columns and rows are sort of like two different stories, right? Like, I think of like a row as like an event or some person or something like that. Or the column is like a feature of the data. So I would say dropping a column might be reasonable if you know that none of your analysis ever depends on that. But yeah, whether whether to drop uh, an entire column or row is an important choice. Mm -hmm. All right. So and this is another sort of like pro tip for presentations. When you have a bar chart, the sort of like default method of plotting some data is sort of just like the order in which it appears in Python. Like Python doesn't know any better. It looks pretty nice, right? It's got some colors, got some stuff going on, like there's some stories we can tell. But we might want to make it easier on our audience by ordering the data. Right. So it makes comparison way easier. And so like if you have a pretty complicated bar chart where the order other variables isn't necessarily in some order. Like if your bar chart is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, there's clearly an order that those should be preserved there. But you can also sort of sort by the size of your of your bar. In that case, making the the comparison between data points much easier. So just for comparison, this is exactly the same data, and, and you know there's no loss of information in the sense of e is still the lowest value and d is the highest. But once I've ordered that set of values, it, it sort of like the ranking becomes clear. Again, not required, just makes it easier for your audience to get the message you're trying to convey. And with the caveat that hopefully the, the actual variable order shouldn't matter if we do this ordering. All right. And then the last, I think the last sort of comment that I had, I, this is interesting to me because I 
had the hardest time trying to explain what the when to use normalization and when not to. So I, did, I still don't have like a super solid story, but I can I can usually detect when someone should be normalizing uh, their data. So an example, this is going back to the the DHS uh, data for for TSA data, and this showed up in quite a few people's presentations. So again, I just have all this data, and I want to know like how many times do the various airports show up in that list, right? And that's a very like straightforward question. Like I look at value counts. So this is how many times GFK showed up? 644 rows, pretty straightforward. And I'm only looking at the top 20, so I'm applying that head trick again, so I don't get the full list back. So no big deal there, right? And so you could say. Well, Baltimore is way down at the bottom of this list, and JFK is way high, right? Like lots of uh, seizures at JFK, right? Is that really the case, right? And the, and the question comes down to how many people did JFK process through their airport compared to how many people got processed through BWI? But it's, it's, what this list is telling you is really that JFK is popular, right? More popular than, than BWI. But if you wanted to know, like, is is JFK an outlier, right? Is it processing like so many people that even though it has a higher number of TSA claims, it's lower compared to the percentage you'd see from BWI? So it's like in this case, it would have been useful to normalize the sort of seizures from TSA by the number of people processed at the airport. So that's and then there's sort of like a when I went to go actually do the normalization. Um, my first go-to was Wikipedia. J Wikipedia said that JFK had uh, 30, uh, roughly 30 million people processed through, and, and, GF and BWI had about 12 million. So that's like a factor of two. Right? JFK is twice as big as BWI, according to Wikipedia, in 2016. And then, so that, and looking back at the data source for this, this came from the FAA, Federal Aviation Administration, so the people who like monitor and secure all of our airports, right? So those, that's a pretty reliable FAA.gov website. So then I look at the BWI reporting, just to like verify is it consistent. And BWI says they processed uh, 25 million people per day. Or sorry, per year in 2016. So 25 million to BWI uh, from their own website is not consistent with what Wikipedia is. And so at this point, I throw up my hands and say, I would like to normalize, but I don't know exactly where to get the accurate data from. So. When I actually tried to do it, I was sort of like blocked. Okay, so a little bit of tangent. Did anyone have any questions? Normalization is, again, tricky to know when it is appropriate to use. I want to make sure everything is the same. But in this case, it would have been nice to make sure that JFK and BWI were really being compared on an equal footing of number of passengers processed. Okay. I'll try and emphasize or bring out other points or examples of that in future classes so that we can uh, have that issue mm, a little bit more solid footing than I've currently got for it. All right. And then, uh, just as a reminder myself, uh, I haven't seen too many people use doc strings, and we'll be presenting that in class uh, in a few of the notebooks. So I've put some links in here so that. Um, if you want to read more about those, you can come back. It's a, a, a way of um, commenting your functions that is in Python rather than in the Jupyter Notebook. Right, so that'll be available by a link. Right, so we have uh, gotten roughly halfway through the semester, so congratulations. This is where I'll be releasing the stickers. <laughs> we have dinosaurs and all that other good stuff in here. All right, so we're going to be doing uh, a lot of hands-on stuff, and I'll be avoiding most of the theoretical stuff. The feedback that I've gotten from other data scientists is that the most common weakness in the data scientists they interview is in the mathematics skills. So um, I only have one class on it. This is an introduction to data science, not math, but um, so I would recommend if you don't have a strong math background, like you haven't taken calculus or linear algebra, there are lots of online courses, 
And the reason for that is math is, uh, you know, 400 years old, you could say, and like pretty well established. So there's lots of online courses and free resources. I'll be focusing a lot on the coding today, even though the complaint from data scientists is that more math and statistics is needed. So all of these will be sort of like demos and hands-on stuff. Right. So the, the first touch here is on uh, the role of math in data science. Like, why do we, why do we even care? And like I said, math is super old, and it has lots of different sort of silos of, of activity that are going on. And so data science typically touches a bunch of those domains. So linear algebra. Who here has taken a course in linear algebra? Right, like thirty percent or so. Right. Um, who else in statistics? Whew, wow. All right. No need for statistics then. You get if you guys get bored because there's a lot of statistics here. Let me know. All right. And then probability. That's um, pretty useful for creating models. Uh, the last two calculus and ODEs I won't touch too much because. I haven't seen much practical use unless you're like developing machine learning algorithms from scratch, right? Like if you're in the land, that's cool. I'm not going to be there with you. All right. So again, it shows up, math shows up all over the place in data science and so all the different phases in the data science process have some basis in counting things, typically, um, and grouping things. And so that's where the math sort of wanders in. The problem is, even though data science is super heavy on using mathematics and implementing it, you, when you're telling a story to a customer, they're typically not mathematicians. And so you, your responsibility will be to use uh, and apply the mathematics but then be able to translate that back into a story of pretty pictures and like business impacts. So that's your responsibility as a data scientist. If you expect someone else to do that, you'll probably won't be as successful. All right. Like I said, it's it's huge. Math is a big field. This is a this comes from like a YouTube video that's pretty good about like wandering through all of the different domains. Uh, I recommend that one. Um, I think is linked uh, in the notes. And then the thing, as, as I've emphasized for other sort of like programming um, uh, aspects, you have to figure out for all these different free resources, what is your style of learning and what is the book or course that you're using trying to teach? And if those aren't matched up, you're probably not going to have a lot of fun. So there's plenty of resources. You just have to evaluate all of them to figure out which ones fit your needs. Right. And by the way, UMBC is like known for its mathematics department, so it's a good place to learn math if you want to find somebody who knows what they're talking about. All right, so we're going to narrow it down a little bit. Statistics is um, a subdomain in mathematics, and so uh, it's super useful because we have a bunch of mess and we want to clean it up in a rigorous fashion. So that's what statistics offers us. Um, and then, let's see, yeah, so. I think that's all I wanted to sort of like clarify. Why do we care? So to get started in this, you're normally not handed a pile of numbers. Like you may be, but um, first you have to sort of like take the data you're given, which is usually human generated or uh, sort of like large scale text. And so figuring out how to operate mathematically, that's like, you know, at this level, is it discrete? Is it continuous? And you usually have to apply your knowledge and skills to take the data that you have and convert it into something that you can operate on. So you're typically not handed clean data with the right data types. And so you have to figure out, is this discrete? Right? Is it word category? Is it unordered? Those are things that you'll have to break down. So we're going over a couple of these today. And this is like reasonably straightforward stuff. So I'm not going to spend a bunch of time worrying about it. But the part that will trip you up usually is the fact that we have continuous variables, but we have computers which expect discrete things. And so um, trying to figure out uh, how to do that transformation without loss of information. Like you want to make sure that when you go to the discrete description of an event that you haven't lost the, the information that's important. So 
So we usually do that um, without even noticing, right? So like, for example, if you look at this set of eyes and I ask you what color are those, almost all of you will say blue, right? I get, I may get some outliers here, but the assumption here is that we can make these things that are uh, continuous, right? Like there's no actual single one color in that picture, but we put a label on it and make it a discrete variable. That makes our job easier, even though it's inaccurate. So th this is something that you'll run across quite often, is that we make things discrete to make our analysis easier. Right, and that rounding is sort of like the trick that we use. All right, so that was my sort of introduction section. And I'll talk a little bit about prob probability, and we'll do an exercise. All right, so I said statistics was how we sort of like make sense of the mess. And probability is the way that we sort of build models to describe the mess that we're, that we're looking at. All right, so I think everyone here has familiar with the deck of cards, so I didn't bring those as my demo. But uh, if, if, if you're not familiar with it, it's basically a set of paper, like very small. No. <laughs> All right. So they're sorted into like four categories, and each category has 13 sort of numbers associated with it. And so they have 52 total cards in a standard deck. And so when I ask a question, I can either do an experiment, right, or like use your intuition. And so in this case, I'm going to use your intuition. Then if, if I ask this question, Anybody have an answer for that? Okay, so we had our fourth. Anybody disagree with that? Everybody's good on that? All right. So even though there's 52 cards, each uh, uh, color, uh, there's two colors, but the trick is that the probability is just there's 13 choices out of 52 total options, and, I, and that's for each um, heart, diamond, club, and spade. So one-fourth. All right, so <laughs> this was sort of like a intended to be a physical example. We can also do uh, similar things with Python. I think most of you have used the random library, so we'll do a quick demo of that. Random. Uh, what's it called? Getting started. So who here has used dir command, D-I-R? OK, a couple people. That's pretty good. So if I'm in a, uh, in a new Python environment, the dir command is just going to tell me all the variables that exist by default in Python. So that's the output list here is all the variables that just are in the background that you typically aren't sort of wary or cautious or aware of. But the other use of dir is to tell you for a given uh, library, so I've imported random. I'm looking at what's in that. I can use dir to see what the commands are from random. So most of these I don't care about, so I'm going to scroll past the ones with underscores. Down here, this is where like the useful things typically are, right? So like all of these variables are things that I would typically want to call in a notebook. And so you, you can discover those either by reading the documentation or within your Python notebook running the dir command. All right, so again, I think everyone has used this, so I'm not going to spend too much time, but you can make choices and add managers. This will be useful on your homework if you haven't seen random before. Foreshadowing. All right, so at this point, we're going to take a, let's see, take a break from the lecture part to grab your name tags, grab a penny from the table, grab stickers. Or your name tag. Right, the stickers are for your name tag, right? By the way, this will be a permanent choice that you're inflicted with for the rest of the semester. Wow. <laughs> Make this choice wisely, right? Because this is something you have to live with for weeks. <laughs> That's a lot of pressure. <laughs> it is, right? It's like a life choice. Go a piece of paper and a penny to take back to your desk. Definitely going to die soon.
<laughs> the world's your oyster, man. A, a sticker, a penny, your name tag, and some paper. And if you don't have a pen, you'll also need a pen. Give me for a pen, and I'll grab you one. On your name tag, that's, that's where we're going with it. Yeah, sorry, I didn't make that clear that the sticker goes in your name tag. <laughs> And it's not a requirement that you solve the problem now, <laughs> but it's available. Don't be fresh. Can I take the whole thing? If that's the kind of person you are, I can't do anything about that. <laughs> All right, so once you've got your penny, we have an exercise for you. Remember, I'm a poor professor. I will need the pennies back, so do not pocket penny. <laughs> yes, I have a <laughs> All right, so you've got your penny at your desk, you've got your name tag, you got some stickers, you're feeling pretty good. You take your piece of paper and you flip your coin 10 times and write down the results of your experiment. <laughs> Thank you. Peter. You're welcome. If you need help flipping a penny, <laughs> like this is the fancy version, you can put it in your thumb, flip it. And catch it. That takes a lot of coordination, especially if you're going to watch it. There's just like drop it, give her a drop. But that's the way it's broken. Is there something about random, like, or like, you just can't actually generate random numbers or something like that? <laughs> they're, they're poor, like, for true randomness, yes, they're not that good. They're good enough for many things, but it depends on, like, how big you're going. Like, if you're doing a lot of random numbers, then there can be some patterns that you didn't want. Like, if you just say, I just want one number, probably going to happen. I don't think they know. Yeah. <laughs> but if you're doing things at a large scale, it can be a problem. All right. So while you're flipping, I'm going to talk. Probably won't be too distracting. So obviously, if you flip a coin once, there's two possible outcomes. Right? Pretty straightforward. If you flip two times, there's four possible outcomes, right? Heads, 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 tails, tails, heads, or tails, tails. So you can do this whole counting game. And what you find is that in general, if I flip the coin n times, there are two to the n possible outcomes. Now, this is like a kind of abstract idea, so what does it actually mean? When I flip this coin 10 times, which is what you're doing, that means 1,024 potential outcomes. That seems like a lot. We're only 22 people, so we can't cover that entire space of all the outcomes. If I do 20 coin flips, which is a perfectly reasonable thing for a few minutes to do, there are 2 to the 20th, which is a million different outcomes. Right, so that's a lot of outcomes. I'm not going to have you write down all of them, but that's the thing. So it sounds like the penny flipping has quieted down, so it sounds like we're ready to move on. All right, so now we have a challenge for you. I don't know if I have everybody on here. All right, so if I don't have your name on there, I apologize. So the challenge is you just wrote down an experimental outcome. Right? The goal now is to write a Python program which simulates that environment and finds that experimental outcome. Like it's mirroring it? So, right, so like you found a pattern from a random set of sequences, right? The challenge is can you do that in Python? Thank <laughs> you. 
All right, so there are pairs of names up here. That's your partner for the exercise. <laughs> and I think Travis is not here, and Dan is. So, Dan, you, you will be Travis for this exercise. Who is Travis? Travis and John Jim. So you're here with John Jim. <laughs> the undiscoverable. <laughs> DJ is over here, so DJ, you have to actively find your partner. <laughs> Just wait for your partner to show up. <laughs> Yeah, there's plenty of room, so you spread out. Now everybody has to be at the center. <laughs> Yo. I'll be wandering around for questions. Uh, I did come back and I, uh, yeah, yeah. 
So we'll take another two minutes or so, and then we'll figure out where everybody's at. So two minutes from the done plan. By the way, so yeah, you renamed it as SDR. So let's let's do a print after the red is out of pen. Let's do a print of red. Thank you. 
So we're going to wrap up this part of the exercise. Does anyone have like a numeric result that they want to throw at me? Verbally. What's the number? Um, 3,066. 3,066. Okay. I might have a, how many times do they need to put their coin in Python to get that sequence? I think that was probably a missing part. Right? I mean, I just, <laughs> anyone else? Nobody solved it. I mean, like nobody finished the notebook in the time. Something. Four number one. That's fine. So, <laughs> all right. So I think at this point you can go back to your desk, um, and I will show you one solution. <laughs> Oops. All right, if, if, you, if you feel bad for not finishing this problem, it's something you can totally work on at home, but I'm not going to be grading, so it's like I can offer you feedback, but it's not, not an assignment. Coin flips. All right. All right. So, so as an example of what the, in, what the intention was, is that suppose that I flip a sequence, and here I'm going to use one for heads and two for tails. So I have this sequence of four numbers, one, two, two, or one, two, one, one. And I want to figure out how many times would I need to flip a coin to get that sequence. So the way that I implemented a very verbose solution um, was I said, I'm going to create a function that creates a random sequence of coin flips. Um, so I can say uh, what the length of the sequence should be and how many coin flips to make. Let's see. So I'm going to flip a coin a certain number of times, and then uh, the coin flips count. I'll increment it every time that I flip a coin, and I'm choosing between one and two for that coin outcome. And then I'm creating the output of this function as a list. So I say this run, which is my list, I'm going to append the outcome of that coin flip. So basically, this is a piece of paper where I'm writing down the outcomes of the coin flip. That's, that's the purpose of this function is to basically do the experiment. And then the challenge is do this experiment a bunch of times and figure out 
whether the output is comparable to the list that I had. All right. Oh, yeah. So the other thing is I'm using uh, a doc string here. So that's the, the triple quotes and then and I call those triple quotes within the function. So this is a way of documenting what the function does. It's an alternative that's sort of Python specific rather than using uh, Markdown in your notebook. So if you see that, that's a thing. I won't use it too much in this class. I have a couple notebooks that show that, but it's just another option to be aware of. So then I said, uh, and this is my, my function where I, I have searched through calling that create random sequence a bunch of times and then see whether or not that sequence of it uh, that I originally put matches the sequence that I, uh, that I did in the function call. And if I find that there was a match, then I break out of the loop and I say, the number of point flips to match this was, in this case, 112. That's sort of like the, the logic of the program. It'll be available in Blackboard after class, so you can take a look at it. And then, so uh, you can just sort of like put in arbitrarily long sequences of coin flips and see how long it takes. The fun thing to me is like, and this is why I like programming, I guess, is because this, you can run through this, um, a bunch of times in Python very quickly. I just think it ran. All right, so for a sequence of length 13, I can throw that in there. And that runs in 0.7 seconds, even though it's doing 91,000 coin flips. So this is like, why do I program? This is why, because I can't flip a coin, you know, in a day, 90, 91,000 times. So, all right, and then I think I can visualize that. And just this is like a little geeking out, right? So like, I can do that same function, and I can count how many times uh, the coin came with a certain outcome. I'll rerun all the cells. And so for my coin, I run this. Let's see, so here I'm just flipping it 50 times, and my outcome, right, it's not always the same. It's going to be, it should be around 50% of the time, heads and tails. But even for a fair coin, it's not going to be perfect every time. And so we can sort of like make that difference smaller if I increase the number of coin flips. So here I've got 500 coin flips. And there I got you know a number of heads and tails that's pretty even. But if I rerun this notebook, it'll have some other outcome. So every experiment that I do is going to yield a different result. All right. And then one more sort of like cool thing before we go on break. Um, this is a website that's available, and you can go to it and see how code works. So I'm just going to take that uh, that Python code that I just showed you about having a function where I do a coin flip and get a sequence, and then I test whether that sequence matches the one that I provided. And then on the right-hand side, it's currently blank. But there's a little stepping bar down here at the bottom. And it says there's 309 steps. So hopefully this boggles your mind. Because when I first saw it, I was like, holy crap. All right. So I hit the, the forward progress indicator. And it moves down the sequence. Um, so it just created a, maybe a little bigger. Uh, so it created sort of like a, a visualization of what the program is doing in the background. So as I step through this program, it's saying, OK, now you're going to go off and make a of size uh, 4. And there's going to be values 1, 2, 1, and 1. All right. And then the next step in the Python program calls this uh, function. All right. So this is our, our stack of memory with all the variables that we're keeping track of. I'll just start. This is from the website. So I'm, this is all the magic of the website that I'm. You paste your code in and say visualize execution. Yeah. And so this is like a. This is really useful for building your intuition as to what Python is doing behind the scenes for you. 
so that when you're running your code, you can sort of have a better idea of why is the code behaving the way it is. All right, so here I created in this line right here, line 13. I said this <coughs> one is an empty list, and I can see that that was created. And it's telling me what Python's doing in the background. So now I'm going to enter the while loop. And then it's going to go up to that function. The first function call creates uh, a new sort of like memory space because all those variables in the function are local to the function. So that's why it's creating this separate block of visualization. All right, so now I create an empty list for the function. I increment my index, I flip a coin. Right, this is what my program is doing. So I'm not going to step through all 309. Uh, Python steps here for the execution, but you can basically step through yourself and see what your code does. It's a really useful way of building up a mental model of your code execution. Questions on that? <laughs> I'm glad that some people are actually excited about this because, like, it's super, super useful to build that intuition. Because, like, normally, if you're just programming, you'd have to, like, build up this interior mental model yourself. It's a little difficult. No joke, right? So. All right, I think, yeah, I think break. So um, come back at 8.12. And we'll come back and talk a little bit more math. By the way, I think back to pennies Yeah, I got more stick. 
Stickers? What's up? Yeah. <laughs> a lot of choices here in life. <laughs> All right. We're not sticking to the 12, <laughs> 8 12 time on. That was like 15 minutes. It was like 8 10 when you said that. Well, on this clock, it was 8 08. <laughs> How long is a reasonable break? I would say five minutes. Five minutes? Okay. Doable. Hmm? Tra travel time. <laughs> I was able to get that. There's no eraser. You walk in at it. It is true. I was way late. Yes. Huh? <laughs> So I don't know if I've told this class, but y'all are basically my guinea pigs. Um, so that was an evaluator from the graduate school to comment on my teaching ability. <laughs> Thank you. You'll have the opportunity. Yeah, so, you, so there will be a separate opportunity later, like a few classes from now, to do an anonymous feedback rather than telling me. So that'll come. Yeah, but I didn't know. <laughs> yeah, I need to build my ego for sure. <laughs> I mean, I do appreciate honest and, and direct feedback, but I know that's somewhat challenging to, to you know provide from a student perspective because of the power differential and the grading aspect right, and all this other good stuff. So anonymous feedback is pretty useful. All right. Yeah, so I, I sort of just jumped ahead without realizing it. Basically, all I wanted to show with this was that you can plot uh, a bar chart in Python to look at the outcomes for your coin flips. And what that is showing is for just two outcomes, there's a uniform distribution. So they're relatively equal. If you had a bunch of variables, the different outcomes that you're looking at, the outcome would also be flat right, for all the different variables. That's called the uniform distribution. So that's like a really useful place to start. You can build other distributions from the uniform distribution by applying some transformations. Not in this book, but this is like where you should typically start with, with any probabilistic sort of model. OK, the other. Continuous variables again. So I'll be basically focusing on the binomial distribution because that's most of like what you'll be doing is a set of discrete events with independent trials, right? So every time that you flip the coin, the coin wasn't aware of what the last outcome was, and so it can't sort of like change its outcome based on the history. So that's what we mean by independent. You're using the same coin every time. That's the identical part, um, and then you're repeating that a bunch of times. Uh, yeah, 
and then basically um, binomial by right two two outcomes, and the outcomes are either going to be like heads or tails. And they could be 40, 60, could be 50, 50 at that split of like what is the outcome? That's the the p there that we're referring to. All right. So where where this is going is that we can construct a bell curve using these these coins. Not that I'm going to have you do that right now. I'm going to switch over to Python, and you'll see why in a minute it would be unreasonable to construct this bell curve. Binomial distribution. All these notebooks will be available to you in, in, in Blackboard. I'm going to restart all cells. This will actually take a little bit of time to run because what we're doing is we're going to flip a coin a thousand times. And we're going to do that, that experiment, a thousand times. So that's a lot of coin flippage. So that's why we're not doing it in person. Um, the reason that we're doing that is we're trying to figure out when I flip a coin a thousand times, like on average, right, it should be roughly 500 heads and 500 tails. Right? That's like a, a naive assumption. But it might be that you get, you know, 400 tails and 600 heads, right, or some other mixture when I do a thousand coin flips. And so I need to do that trial many times in order to figure out what is this, what's the average, right, that, that mean value, but then what is the spread of, you know, how many times we get 400 versus 600, how many times we get 500 versus 500, right, what, what is that outcome? Um, so basically, all this walks through. Um, there's a little bit of uh, list comprehensions that you'll be able to look at, but basically, I'm building up this this experiment to figure out um, how many times did I get heads, um, and so this is the number of trials on this axis, and this is the number of times I got heads. So you see that the distribution is centered around 500 times I got heads. Makes sense, and this width is sort of like you can say. The, the, the point, how, many, how confident are we about that outcome being fair? Because it could be, right, this is like probability. You could say, like, I flipped a, a, a coin a thousand times. It was heads 500 of those times. So the outcome was, like, perfectly fair. Well, that's not an accurate statement, right? It happened to be that, that in that trial, you got that even distribution. But most of the time, um, it'll be slightly above or below that. So we can play around with like the, the display of that by setting uh, the axis to be focused on the range we care about for the number of outcomes, and then we can uh, set the number of. Uh, scrolled off the screen here. Yeah, the number of bins here I've, I've increased to be the number of coin tosses per trial, so a thousand. So and then I, I labeled my axes, which is good. Then the previous one I apparently forgot. And then there's other libraries where you can uh, use Seaborn, uh, and that actually does the the fit for that automatically by default. So it's kind of handy. If you haven't used Seaborn, it's definitely uh, more beautiful than the the MATLAB matplotlib output that we would normally use. Okay, and I think yeah, I didn't get back to. So I I wanted to do error bars on my original plot, but I didn't get to that. So. You'll be short, shorted that outcome. So the point of all that sort of like quick discussion is that let me get to the next slide. All right. So using the same coin, we got this outcome. Right? A bunch of big trials leading to these various results. What's the relation between these? Right? Like this is one trial, and this is the outcome of a bunch of trials. So. We can get a uniform distribution versus a binomial distribution. So there's some deeper meaning to that. And, and the, the answer to go back to, like, what is the relation between these? And unfortunately, I didn't plot the error bars for this original curve. But there's a confidence interval of, like, this was um, the outcome here is slightly below 250, and then it was slightly above 250. That was for one trial. But typically, we want to label. Uh, the confidence interval of an experimental outcome. And so the way that we do that is we run a trial a bunch of times. 
and then we ask like what is the what are the the dimensions of this this shape and that will tell us the constants from all of these and they'll put air bars on them. So it's like the, the high level view is that you get air bars from doing a bunch of trials. Right? And then and the details behind that a confidence interval, that's the, the air bar that you typically put on a bar chart. That's telling you how certain we are about the average outcome. So the more trials we do, the more certain we'll be about the outcome. So you can change your confidence level by doing more trials. That's like a relatively straightforward uh, discussion, I think. Where that gets a little tricky is that that bell curve, there are parameters associated with that, like variance, standard deviation, you may have heard of those. Those don't change as you increase the number of trials. So the shape of the curve is constant, hopefully, as you do more and more trials. So the confidence level goes up, and the standard deviation and variance do not change. So the reason for one of those changing that is not is because the confidence interval is really a measure of how much area is under this curve. And the, the actual shape of the curve, which is what the variance and deviation are, are saying, those parameters don't change. So how much area is under this curve? That's for the, the expression like 95% confidence interval. It is the area of that, that curve. So you can sort of like understand that the more trials you do, the more area you're going to capture. Uh, so you'll have higher confidence in that outcome. I think I'm slowly losing people, so we'll <laughs> questions on that. Okay. All right, so we've been talking a lot about experiments. It's the way that I live my life, but it's not the only way to live your life. Because sometimes, like for geophysicists, they just can't replicate the Earth, right? They, they can't do an experiment with another Earth. So what do you do then, right? So, or maybe it's really expensive to do that. So there's an, so what I've been sort of presenting to you is what's called the frequentist approach. This is like do a bunch of experiments, they're all independent and they're the same, and so therefore we can build up a model based on that. There's another class of people, another sort of religious camp, called the, the Bayesianists, right? The, the Bayesian interference folks. They're trying to figure out um, without doing all that work. And so in one sense, you could say the, the Bayesian interference people. They're trying to figure out what the answer is without doing the work. So there's a bit of risk there, right? That the assumptions are wrong. And so they spend a lot of their time validating their assumptions. Whereas the frequentist people spend a lot of their time running the experiments. So are you saying that they start backwards so that they start the Yes, I think that's it. I'm not gonna speak with authority, but I think that's correct. Yeah, so, so there's two different ways, and basically it's like, where do you want to spend your time working, right? Building the model or testing the assumptions. That's it. Okay, so now we have like a fun little diversion over correlation. There's a, there's a bit of like a funny part in here. Hopefully you laugh. All right, but to get to the joke, we have to do some math, so I apologize. All right, so what I was talking about earlier is that variance, that's the width of that bell curve, right? that's for a single variable. Right? In this case, we're doing point and flip outcomes. That was the single variable we were testing. Some, and so that's, that's this picture, right? Sometimes we want to know um, the relation between two variables, and then we talk about correlation. And so correlation and variance are related, and they're related by this like bridging term, covariance. So let's talk about covariance. It's joint covariability, which <laughs> that's the alternative word for it. All right, so what is this covariance concept? So here we have two um, parameters that we're measuring x and y. And those outcomes, you can part as these little dots. Those are the, the, the values for the two variables for a given event. And somewhere in there, there's like an average value for the x. It's the expectation value for that x variable. And there's the average value for the y, the expectation here. Right? And so that defines the center of our distribution. And then we can, what we really want to measure at the variance is like how far are things from the mean. 
We want to do that in two dimensions. And the way to do that is to say, uh, how far is this point from that center? One way of putting it is to say, the area of this point to the center is marked up by this pink square. And the other area over here in that point will call another different area. And then these points are blue because those are negative, right? So the, we have to introduce positive and negative areas, those are the two different colors. And so basically you sum up all of these different areas, the positive and the negatives, and then you call that your covariance. So it's a measure of how spread out are things in two dimensions. And then you can take that area, so like I, I think I said, yeah, so back here I was saying like covariance is the sort of spacing out of things in two dimensions. And then you can normalize that to between the negative one and one, and that's your correlation. Questions on that? That's the, that's the concept of correlation. Now here's the fun part. So uh, you can say that there are two variables, right? Um, what's the the divorce rate in Maine, and uh, how many people are consuming or the per capita consumption of margarine in the entire United States? And it turns out if you take those two variables, they're highly correlated. And you'd say, I discovered a predictor, right? If I wanted to figure out how many people are going to be consuming margarine, I just need to look at the number of people getting divorced in Maine. OK, can anyone explain why that happened? <laughs> what was that? Eat more food. So anyone else? Why did this happen? Okay. So the, the reason is if you look through a large enough data set with enough variables, you will find things that are highly correlated. And so there's a whole website, which I totally recommend you should definitely visit, um, where it just has like random things that are correlated. And there's no actual like justification, like there's no like causality. It's just that these these variables, if you look at enough data, are correlated. So question? <laughs> I see what I'm forming on the lips. <laughs> So you're saying that basically just because it's correlated doesn't sensical, right? Yes. But if you look at enough data, you can find coincidence is a good way to think about it. All right, so it's a harder claim to sort of figure out is there a causality between these two variables, right? Does this thing cause the other thing? And that's a much harder test to apply. So don't get swayed by correlation. Although the butter one might make sense because of the <laughs> I don't I don't eat margarine, so I can't really comment on that. That also turns out for it's not a good cooking substance. <laughs> <laughs> I do cook. All right. All right. So where that was sort of leading to is that um, math and counting are objective activities, right? Like you can count a thing and someone else who counts that it's the same result, right? That's why it's objective. But the problem is you can use these tools in inappropriate ways to miscommunicate. And that's sort of like the, the lesson here I'm trying to drive home. So the trick to doing that is to know what all the problems that you could run into are before encountering them. Because if like you don't know what the problems are, you're most likely going to encounter them and then someone else will have to point out to you you're wrong. Right? Or you can like intentionally mislead things, but I won't cover that. That's a different like ethics class. Right. All right. So the, there's a couple of problems that we typically run into in data science, like trying to figure out what all the answers are doesn't work because it's expensive and takes a bunch of time. And so we make our jobs easier by looking at only a subset of things. And so that saves us money and time, makes our job easier, but introduces risk. And this is so there are many lists of biases that you can read up on. This is just to give you an example of like the traps you can fall into. I'm not going to read off those, but um, basically you, you need to have some conception of like what the traps are relevant to the data you're looking at and the problems you're solving so that when you do your analysis, you know what to avoid or what to account for. So the, the point of this slide is to arm you with the, the question in your head of, what should I be watching out for when I analyze a given data set? And because I can't tell you what all the biases are, 
specific to your data set, that's going to be your job. And typically, this isn't so much of an issue if someone just like hands you a pile of data, like I've been doing, right? Because that's like that's what the data said. That's all we have to go on. But this is more of an issue when you're designing an experiment or you're designing some data collection system, which you will invariably do as a data scientist. But like, it won't always be the case. You just get handed things. So you'll be designing experiments and and collections, and that'll be a challenge. All right, time series. The next lecture, by the way, is on time series. So this is going to be a slight sort of like taster of it. But it's a pretty big field. All right, so this is a little uh, reminder that um, a lot of what I do in my work is I go off and talk to people. And the reason for that is because even though people throw a bunch of data at me, like a lot of time series, um, my ability to understand that data is heavily influenced by the folklore that I understand from people. So there's the one of the mention, one of the ways that I get folklore is I talk to people. The other is I have an internal model of what the reality is. And those two sort of like build on each other. So what I'm going to be doing uh, in a few slides here is to ask for your folklore. Right? You have internal knowledge based on the fact that you've lived here for at least a few weeks, and, and like you have. Um, knowledge about how this this environment works. Okay, so, next slide. All right. so if anyone needs paper, let me know. But what I'm going to ask you to do is we're going to look at some power data, electrical power information. And the axes for the plot that I'm going to draw on your paper are time and power. So ask me questions that you want. I will dispense answers to them. But I want you to draw a picture of what the power looks like or a function of time on the span of days. Yeah, does that make sense? And this is for the scale of a city. Ah, uh, sure. Good day one. Question? It is uh, irrelevant, but we'll call it January. Does anybody have a question? I mean, I'm hoping for the question here. Does anyone know what a megawatt is? <laughs> no, okay. So, that, that'd be a great, yes, it is a thousand kilowatts. Um, I'm not going to blow up. the definition of different Yeah, yeah, so knowing what it is, it's a, it's a different question. But so, so it is a measure of electrical power. Right? And so I think you're, I don't, I'm not going to go out more than that. I guess your house would consume like. Uh, hundreds of kilowatts, no, tens of kilowatts. <laughs> All right, so, so some number of kilowatts is how much your house consumes, and a, a large city will have um, a few megawatts of power consumption. That does not tell you what it feels like, right? So, um, from a financial perspective, the cost of a megawatt of electricity is a million dollars per year. That means if so our local Energy provider is Baltimore Gas and Electric pg &E. So if I went to pg &E and said I need to buy a megawatt of electricity for a year, they'd say where is your million dollars? So that give you a rough scale of like your electrical bill for your house versus how much it would cost to buy a megawatt of electricity, a million dollars per year. Not accounting for all the financial shenanigans they put. All right. So does anybody have a plot that they'd like to share? Mm, let's see, document. But if we can get it up on the dot cam, I'll be super happy to not turn too much. Source. Oh, no. All right, doc can't mean at work because HDMI is dead. Let's try this one. Okay, came up. All right, who has a plot they would like to share? <laughs> John, hop on up. Here's 
Okay, the point of John's demo here will be for him to defend his logic and explain what he did. That's barely any logic in it. But... <laughs> All right. So, uh, you want to plug it on? Okay. All right. Ignore this. I was taking notes. Um, basically, it's just uh, the number of days along the bottom axis, the power arbitrarily, like just kind of general level of where it's at. Uh, essentially, my thinking was maybe if you're paying your bill monthly for a power bill that after you pay your bill you're like feeling amorous and you just want to like go crazy and you know take long showers or something like that and then so like at the beginning of the month you're using more power and then like as you get busy throughout the month you'll probably like go home or something like that okay. or like go out and not use as much power all right so so what you're expecting is that there'll be a, some average value and there'll be some fluctuations around the average mm -hmm. and there's some motivation for why that fluctuation would occur. Based on the behavior, yes. All right. Thank you. Anybody else have a different plot? Hector, cool. Come on down. So what, what we're doing here, right, is we're trying to establish what is the folklore around electrical power right, for a uh, city. So I don't know if this is going to ask. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you know. I know a little bit about I deal with DHS critical infrastructure. What is DHS? Uh, Department of Homeland Security, I'm sorry. So the way critical infrastructure, the way electricity tends to work, a lot of people don't know, is uh, from, uh, from the East Coast to the West Coast, because the electricity is needed at different times throughout, all power plants kind of work together to wake up different parts of the country at different times throughout the day. I kind of, I knew that. So <laughs> I figured with regard to a major city, what you're seeing here, those peaks here, these are the weekends, right? I imagine a lot of things, a lot of activity occurring. But with regard to the uh, the peaks and the troughs in between, that would be either uh, like rush hour week, you know, things of that nature until we get kind of like steady state point, and then uh, rush hour going back home, at which point it's the peaks again. That was my okay. So I, I love discovering that we have subject matter experts. It's always fun. Uh, so thank you, actor. <laughs> So this is almost like an example of like if you talk to enough random people, you'll find someone who's an expert. So this happened to happen here locally. All right. So we got some feedback on some 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 presenters. So there is internal sort of like knowledge that people have. It varies, right? Like John had an example, Hector had an example. You could tell what the different sort of experience level was in that. So thank you. All right. I'm going to look at a website. It happens to have. So there is a company called Exelon. And I think this is in uh, Scotland, if I remember correctly. But um, So they very politely for you make all their data available. It's super awesome. Right? And they go so far as to plot the live data for you. Is that, I'm like, is that amazing? And like, what, what power company does this? I don't know. But it sort of blocked my mind. Uh, they made, in my opinion, like they made. The fluctuation is very clear by setting this not be equal to zero. Right? So it's like a, it emphasizes the variance of this plot. That's cool. Um, and the time scale here is pretty limited. Right? This is like, I don't know, uh, two hours, I guess. So that's not very much data. Right? So you can say, well, let's get all the data. That's what we do in this class. Right? So they happen to have over here. The, your, your default page here is the latest. There's a historic cap. Guess what that contains? All the data. <laughs> so let's go over there. All right. So they give us this nice intuitive web interface, right, with a start date and an end date. So we'll get the weekend here, right? View. Got a fancy little web page loading thing going on. And then they present the data in a table form, which turns out is not that useful because, like, copy pasting this is a pain in the book. But they happen to present it in XML and CSV for you to download. How convenient. That'll be your homework. <laughs> All right. So we'll come back to that. I think I have some some interesting sort of like observations of that, if I can pull it up. Maybe, no, what did I call it? I keep bringing the name in my notebook. Visualizing time variation. <laughs> All right. So um, I downloaded the data. 
And then, let's see, so, okay. <laughs> uh-oh, I think I may not have the actual data. Let's see if I can download it. Sorry, there'll be a slight delay while I get the data. Mm, let's do that much. Oops, no, all right. This may or may not work, in which case I apologize if it does not. Let's try and get through it. Okay. All right, so is that in there? All right, exciting. All right, so by default, they put in this time of measurement and the value. So this value here is uh, um, kilowatts. Right? Exactly. Go back in the plot. They are giving it. The plot is in megawatts. Yeah. So well, they mislabeled their data. Right? That would be twenty-five megawatts. So ignore their incorrect label also. All right, so I had to do a bunch of sort of magic to read in the CSV. I will probably skip over how I got to that magic. Um, and so then the, I forgot to run the number. All right, so I had to do some conversions. And then I can plot it. See what it looks like. Awesome. All right. So what what we're seeing here, right, is the uh, fluctuation as a function of time. That's really a lot. Of it. Um, so can anyone have any sort of like observation of what's going on here? So can someone look up what 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 day of the week was it on the the second? Saturday, all right? So here we have a Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. Monday. So you can sort of see the function of people were sleeping, right? People woke up, people were home probably in the evening and went back to sleep. So there's a 24 hour cyclic uh, pattern going on here. And there's another pattern of the days, right? So like days of the week, as Hector pointed out, are definitely important because people's behavior on Saturday and Sunday is different than it is during the weekday. So this is uh, just to give you a snapshot of a little bit of time during data with some patterns embedded in it. Kind of a teaser for next week. Questions on that? All right. Good. So that's I think all I have on that one. There's a long sequence of notebooks that I went through to like build that up. And so my point in sharing these old notebooks with you is that um, if you look through these, you can sort of see. Okay. I, I, I did the process of figuring out what's in the data frame, creating all the, the pandas commands to load this data. I'll fix this. All right, so I went and looked at the contents. That's what the CSV looks like. When I try and read that data from the CSV into the data frame, this is my default output. And so this notebook, the sequence of notebooks walks through the problems I had troubleshooting what I had to do to get the, the final output, right? So this final version five, that's the, the exciting part that I showed you. And so it looks very concise, right? It says, do all this magic things, and then make the plot, and, and it appears. Very straightforward, right? But the, the hard part that I'm trying to explain that exists, because it's very easy to get caught up in, oh, it's very simple. Like, you only did one thing. Well, no, there were like five notebooks that I had built to get to that point. And so, uh, knowing commands to use, I had to build up to that process. And so I'll share all these old notebooks with you, but they sort of walk through like, the first problem I had. When you read in the timestamp as they're given, you get this like weird plot. Like it gives you a clue that oh, there's something wrong there. So trying to figure out 
what's going on. Slowly, all the logic builds up. I run into some error. I switch over to a new notebook, right? So that's the intention there. In the interest of time, we'll move on. If I can open it. All right. So the other exciting sort of demo that I want to get to is the Chrome analysis. So, so the goal here is that um, this is a another time series, but it is of totally different data. And and hopefully again this will be a little bit interesting for you because it's something that you can do on that you have. All right. So there's a couple links in this notebook. Um, as to how this process works, um, we'll restart all the kernel. Basically, on my computer, I use Chrome as my web browser. You can do the same project for Firefox. Um, but you can basically get your history on your computer for your web browser, regardless of which browser you're using. So I copy that um, into my local directory. And then if you're familiar with SQL, the Chrome history ends up to be an SQL like file. Okay, so that's like a, a nice data source because you have web browsing pat pattern of behavior, right, and you can investigate that as a data scientist using a real pandas. So basically, you can use pandas to open up your history file, run an SQL command, and get data back. All right, we're building with excitement, I can tell. All right. So, sorry? Uh, so it's, it's, it's specifically the, the file that we're connecting. So SQLite connect to that file, and that, we're going to call it a variable con, and then like we'll call that um, as the uh, reference. Yes. So that's what this next cell is. So I'm not. So this was just to say like I can pluck out time values in this format. This that's what uh, Chrome uses, and so this this cell down here is the actual work. I'm going to pull out the timestamp and the URLs. That's an SQL query. I won't teach you that at this time. So it's just to say that you can run an SQL query against the history file and get back a data frame. Here I have the timestamp for when I visited the site and which site I visited. So that's a nice table to have. Hopefully there were no naughty sites in there, right? <laughs> All right. So then I printed the, the top of the file head. And the bottom of the file, because typically that's where your problems occur in time um, And for whatever reason, these sites are um, occurring back in 1600, December 31st. Highly unlikely. You should all squint and be like, what the heck? Very reasonable. So I'm going to, um, first, the, the both columns are objects. I'm going to force the date time column to be uh, a timestamp. And so when I do that, um, nothing much changes in the visual output here, but these become NANDs. There was some other problem that wasn't quite, quite registering. And so the question of how many NANDs were there, um, there were 13. Right? So I can figure out what the, the max and mean timestamps were. So this um, history file captures my activity from December 31st to yesterday. And then uh, there were 13 of the rows which had invalid timestamps. So for my purposes, 13 out of, uh, I didn't, how big was it? I didn't show how big the file was, but uh, let's do a new, this that shape. Not right. Oops, this, yeah. There we go. So it's 13,000 URLs in the past few months. Obviously, that's a lot of activity, so dropping 13 won't matter too much. Okay. So then, uh, what I can do with this data is I can plot how many URLs I visited in a given month. So here we have the, the bar chart. And here, unlike the earlier bar chart I was talking about, where you know it makes sense to order it, here I would argue that the order does matter, and here it's incorrect. So this is because this is um, October of 2018, December of 2018, and then it moves around to try and order these. So order is a little funky. Apologize for that. So 
The other mistake that you'll see here is that for some reason, there was actually only like a few days in October that were recorded. November wasn't recorded at all. And then like December, January, February, March was reasonable. So why that is, I don't know. All right, so we can do some fancier group by operations and get this uh, year to show up in. So those commands are there, but basically I can say 2018 in October and 2018 in December, and then let's get the year 2019 for those three months. Now I've got the order fixed, and it looks a little bit more pleasing in that order sense. Okay, so that's, those are functions that are there that uh, you'll be able to review. And then I can do some fancier things. Um, so I can say, what is my, what, what day of the month am I visiting the most URLs on, right? So this is ordered by days of month, and this is URLs, which looks like a nice pretty plot, but it's almost meaningless. And the reason for that is because, like, this is the 26th day of October and December and January and February and March. Like, I wouldn't expect any pattern to show up. Like, I don't visit, well, apparently, 21st is pretty rare for me to visit up there. Is it the aggregate? It is the total of Europe for all of those 21st. All right, so I don't have a good, there's, so maybe the takeaway for this is, like, you can plot things, but they don't have a ton of value, right? It does make more sense if we plot, um, say, the, the month and the day. So now we've got basically a per day plot for all the days, and you can see I'm looking for December. Here we go. So the, oh, there's only one day in October that was recorded. That's why the October date showed up. But this is January, February, March. No, sorry, January, February, and March are here. That makes sense. So now we've got the day and month. That plot makes more sense. And you'll see, like, there is this range of days where there's either like zero bits or very few. That's when I was in Taiwan, but I didn't. Remember. So like you, this is now a story that I can tell, right? That sort of makes sense to me. Okay. I think this last one is yeah, just hour or day, which is another fun story. So you can see like this is the this is local time. And so the hour here is like six AM, seven AM, eight AM, nine AM. Right, so guess when I sleep. <laughs> Apparently for those five hours. Right, but again, this is average over all of the data for all of the days for all of those months. And so this is the cumulative count um, at uh, yeah, 10 p.m., right? So at, at 10 p.m. over the past few months since December, I visited 1,600 sites. Yeah. So this is, why, do I, why am I showing this? It's, it's time series data, right? You can extract stories out of it right, by looking at sort of what I call the, the burstiness of activity. And so it's very clear. When I get home from work is about five, and then I do work on the internet, right? These are my searches at work. So cool, fun stuff that you will be using for your assignment for homework. Yes, Alex. Uh, I can check that and get back to you. I'm going to guess that's real light free. Woo <laughs> yeah, so that, that's a library that I imported, import SQL light three. So. That is a good question. I don't have an answer for it. You're asking, can I use, can I use SQL light against a CSV? I don't. Yeah, I have no idea. I have the what? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So the whole, oops, sorry, the point there is to say that for time series, there's lots of simple analysis you can do. In the next class, we'll be covering more depth on different pattern analysis. These are just sort of like a set of visual 
stories to tell just off of the, the data. And that's what you'll be doing in the homework assignment. All right, so I just showed you a bunch of histograms and, and, and bar charts. There's some subject, uh, objective sort of design that goes into that. I don't have a rule of thumb about what the right sort of outcome should be, but it's, at least for me, intuitive to say, like, this bar chart has too many bins, this has too few, and this sum is right. But the Goldilocks method of data analysis, is, I don't have anything better than that, so I apologize. Like, this is an issue you'll run into when you're doing histograms. It's something that you have to play with to figure out what the right answer is. Oops. Is that, is that all I have? Okay. That's the only comment I have on that. But we'll come back to visualizations in a bit. So, all right. So, so this is building off of the, the example that I just gave you, like, uh, the purpose of using sets in Python is typically to look for intersections or overlaps and uh, measure that type of thing. So that, that's the question that it sort of leads you into the sets domain. Right. So a very simple example is like stuff I own now, stuff I owned 10 years ago, right? And that's the intersection there is like things that I've had in my possession for the past 10 years. So just to give you a, another example of where sets come into play in Python. So I think I have a little quick example here. All right, so if you, many of you have already used sets in the previous homeworks, so uh, you may not have encountered all these issues though, so that's when I walk through it. Um, Step by step here. So, sets are basically a collection of objects or, uh, that are unique, they're, they're distinguishable. So, I, I can't have a re repeated object. So, that's, I mean, it's a little confusing because the set notation is using those curly brackets, which also show up in dictionaries, but dictionaries are not hashable, which I'll explain a little bit. So, it's using the curly brackets that identifies it as a set. And so each of those entities, they're distinguishable according to Python because they have different hash values. And so something I learned when I was uh, figuring this out is that every variable that has a unique hash, you can figure out what that hash is. And it's basically like a unique identifier for the variable. That's, that's present for every unique entity. So typically, we don't work with sets by default. We work with lists. And so you can take a list of things and convert it into a set. The consequence of doing that is that you lose all the repeat elements. So here I have four and four and then and then frame twice. And so when I convert it into a set, it gives me only the, uh, the collection of unique objects. I just showed you that I can convert a list to a set. That doesn't always hold true. So if my list has a thing in it that isn't able to be made unique, like a dictionary is not able to be made unique because these values are dynamic, they can change. So when I can when I convert that list, then it says it's unhashable, complaining that this thing isn't being able to be made unique, so we can't make this list into a set. So that's sort of like a, a little problem you may run into. If you can make a set, the reason that you tip you want to do that is intersections. And so there's some, some syntax that didn't get executed here because the cell got interrupted. But we'll make a set, and then we'll do the uh, and. So this is looking for what are the things in this set and in another set. And then it returns the things that overlap from both of those. And then I, when I like ask for the or, that returns the combination of all the things in both sets. But again, still unique. The most, the, why am I discussing this? Because the most common mistake that gets made is people use the, the Boolean and and or. So they're, they're distinct. This is the hamper 
sugar can and the, the bar, those are the set operations. These are the boolean operations. So what does that mean? Well, so follow me along in this, this little tour. Um, we have two sets, and I have this set of unique items and another set of unique items. And you'll see by inspection that some things are in both sets and some things are only in one of the sets. And so when I use the, the Boolean hand, what I get back is this thing. And when I use the, the Ampers hand, I get back to this set. So they both return sets, but only one of them is what we usually intend. The reason for that is the Boolean hand is just looking for, is this statement true? Is this statement true? Yes. Okay, then we're going to return this to the last one. So it's, it's a little bit of Boolean logic that can catch you up if you're not waiting for it. And so this is the one we usually want to use to figure out where the intersection of the two sets is. And the reason for why the Boolean returns something else, this is something I don't understand at this point. But when you ask what is the Boolean value of the variable another set, that returns true. That's why the the expression returns what it does. I don't have a good explanation for the Pythonic reason for returning a Boolean value from evaluating a set. Anybody has any suggestions? Let me know. Like none? That's a good question. So, like, I think what you're proposing is if I say bool none, I'm kind of curious. <laughs> All right. So, the last tip here is that. If you're trying to wonder what a thing does, like an operator, you can use the help function. So this is distinct from the deer, which you mentioned earlier. But the help function will tell you what's going on with that operator. OK. That's a random collection of tips I have for sets. I think that's all. That's it. Yeah, OK. All right. <laughs> going to jump over it. So we've got uh, like 35 minutes left, and we're going to jump into uh, NumPy. And then I think we'll take a break for five minutes. Come back at 9.09.
I think we got everybody back, so we'll get started again. Okay, so, so I was having a discussion during break about, like, you know, why do, would you need the advanced mathematics? And then the real answer is, like, it strongly depends on where within data science you're going to try and work. Most of my work is with exploratory data analysis, not so much designing machine learning algorithms. For like new purposes. So if you're going into the designing new machine learning algorithms, a lot of the advanced mathematics is totally relevant and you definitely should be exposed to. For my work, I typically don't use a bunch of advanced mathematics because I'm just like cleaning data almost all the day, right? Like that's that's my life. Visualization, cleaning data, that's where I live. So for my purposes, I use some of these tools and for that purpose it can be sort of comforting to know the mathematics behind the tool. It's not like deeply essential to understand like, you know, why are we doing this operation versus this operation? Like from my perspective as EDA, I don't care. Like, someone else solved that problem, so I don't have to. But it all depends on where you're gonna end up, right? Like a lot of you I hope will be doing some advanced data science and machine learning algorithms, hopefully with your degree from this program. And so this may be more relevant to you. I'm just on the front end of getting the data, getting the data. Okay. So yeah, specifically, linear algebra shows up in a couple different places. Again, a lot of machine learning focus um, exploits the mathematics that's there. So the way that we typically do the linear algebra operations in uh, Python is with a library called NumPy, which you've probably been exposed to quite a bit already, but maybe haven't flexed all the, the tools in NumPy. So the, the reason that we operate on uh, with linear algebra is because it's like the, the way that we deal with basically tables of data, right? In, in math, it's called a matrix, but if you have 
list, right? You can think of it as a vector. And if you have a, a set of three-dimensional arrays, call it a matrix. And if you have three dimensions or more, call it a tensor, right? Hence tensor flow. So let's see if we can jump over to NumPy. Why do pandas uh, yes, it is. Mm. All right, so the, the, the value, NumPy forces you to think about things a little bit differently because it's linear algebra. So typically, you've been working with lists. And the, the operations that you do with a list are slightly different. So the first sort of distinguishing characteristic is that vectors all have the same type as the elements, whereas a list can contain a bunch of different things. There are things you can do with vectors you can't do with lists by default. So like if I try to divide a list of numbers, or even like this list up here, by a scalar value, that wouldn't work out in Python. But that is well defined in linear algebra, so it is an operation you can do in NumPy. So that's sort of like the <laughs> it it requires a little bit of change in thinking, but it, um, depends on how strong your background is in linear algebra. So in addition to arrays, you can construct matrices. Again, they're probably not totally relevant to the work that we're doing in 601 here, but they will be useful for if you're in 602. You haven't already explored that. Um, and so a lot of the things that we see in pandas are from NumPy, which goes back to that question of what's the relation between the two. So for instance, you can ask, what is the shape of this NumPy array? And it gives you the number of rows and columns. So that's that should sound familiar. So a lot of the things do carry over, like indexing from zero in a list, same thing as uh, indexing from zero in, in NumPy. I think that's all I have on that. It's just, just to get you realizing that like NumPy is different, even though we exploit it under the hood when we're using pandas, we don't sort of like worry about that fact. Has anyone here like used NumPy in anger? Is this same? No. Okay. So I, I think hopefully if you progress through 602, hopefully they expose you a little bit more to to doing linear algebra operations in NumPy. But uh, again, that's more focused on like designing the algorithms and implementing them from scratch, which most people do not do. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so if you are curious about, like, I have no exposure to linear algebra, what do I do? There's tons of online courses for linear algebra, and a lot of them do start from, like, the very basics. But some, some of them, like, ramp up quickly into, like, this is the theory. And, like, so it, it depends on sort of what you're looking at. If you need recommendations, let me know. But Again, it strongly depends on where you're coming from in your educational background. All right. The calculus and differential equations, don't worry. It'll be about as short as a NumPy version, right? So again, we do use calculus and data science, and we do use partial differential equations and ordinary differential equations. But they're not exposed to you if you're using pandas, typically, right? Someone else has done the hard work of implementing these libraries in C, and then you get to call them from pandas and not even worry about how it executes. So this is like the, the value of an abstraction layer is that you don't have to worry about someone else's hard work. And this is like the, the rate of change is like, that's the big takeaway for differential equations. Like if we want to look at how something is evolving and you care about the rate of change, that's where your differential equations come in. Right. So where that shows up is in optimization which is used extensively in machine learning to find out, you know, is my training of this model improving the outcome or not? It's like a standard uh, machine learning uh, use, but again, not typically exposed to the people who are using the tools uh, unless there's some underlying flaw. There is value, like I said, in understanding the reasoning behind these tools so that you can say it is appropriate to use this method or not. And, um, you're typically not going to attack the optimization of that implementation. It is worth knowing whether it's a relevant approach or not. I think that's pretty much what I'm saying. Yeah. Okay. So, like I said, 
my day is not filled with that type of work. So I will tell you what my day is filled with. Mostly emails and meetings. So if you're like excited to go into the data science, like write code and solve problems, and like then you get into a large organization, that probably won't be your life. Kind of like sitting down every day and writing code at the computer. Like that is a thing that I do, maybe like an hour or so a day. But a lot of it is spent coordinating between people who are doing different things and different projects with different backgrounds, right? So I work with like electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, uh, computer scientists, mathematicians, right? All these people speak different languages. And the data scientist is often turned to as the person who bridges the different problems, right? So that's a communication effort because you're expected to have a background in math and domain expertise and programming and able to implement solutions. So you are the unicorn that does all the things. Therefore, you communicate with all the people. Therefore, you get less exposure to actual technical time to get hands on keyboard. So this is sort of like the, the tension that I have to balance is I, I want to remain technically relevant and capable of doing actual things and also be able to pivot the organization in a way that I think it should move. And I can't do both of those things at the same time. So finding that balance is a lot, a lot of my, my work. Any questions on that? Right. Yes. So, uh, as a little uh, my career path has been uh, going up to the senior developer. Yep. And, uh, okay. What would be for a data scientist career path? Like, where to start out as a data scientist? Yeah. <laughs> so, that's a good question. I have. From what I've seen, um, it, it depends. If, if your organization is like, there's two path, two options there, right? So if organizations that are very new don't have well-defined processes or roles, and so you can sort of get to define what you're doing. If the organization is like expanding rapidly, defining itself all the time, right? So like there's a lot of freedom there, but also a lot of uncertainty, right, in your role. And so in contrast, if you're with an existing organization, like I am an organization that's very old, and so therefore has well-defined bureaucratic processes, and they have well-defined roles. Data scientist, as a role, is very new. So I'm in an organization which has, like, if you're an engineer, there's been tons of engineers that have gone through the, that organization, and they know exactly what to do with engineers. Right? They know what to do with lawyers. Lawyers go through another track, right? Data scientist, it's a new position. So right now, my organization is sort of like flummoxed of, like, what do we do with these people that we've never seen before do a bunch of different things? And they don't have this like narrow definition, right? Because like intrinsically a data scientist is crossing all these different domains, so we can't put them in a silo. Right? And that's causing some problems because we don't know how to answer that question as an organization. Yeah, I think that um, you know, a lot of the articles that I've read that you just mentioned about it's not there. Exactly. <laughs> it's like, well, are you a manager? Are you a part of the organization data scientist? Exactly. Uh, do you kind of just go by your experience? Yeah. So I, I think so. What I've seen is that the people. So there were data scientists before that role as a title existed, and so those are the people who are sort of answering your question of like, what are they doing now? Even though they are a data scientists. So uh, a few examples are there are people who have remained the core technical data science role, even though they've just gotten older and gotten paid more. So. It, Staying technical is one option. Another option is like because you have a bunch of different um, exposure to different problems, you become very attractive as a project manager because project managers are responsible for coordinating a bunch of different aspects on a project. So, so that's not quite a manager role of people. It's more like a project manager of different problems within a project. So data scientists sometimes fall into that. And then just because of what I do, I fall into the category of like organizational debugger of like trying to figure out like what are all the problems what do we do about you know where do we spend the most effort right and like talking to a bunch of people all the time and like also little prototype demos of like here's what we could do so there's fewer of those people but because again you have the technical skill and the, the ability to communicate across domains those are uh, attractive skills for that type of role which is less well defined Okay. 
Similar, yeah. I guess you could call that last role the organization debugger and the architect. Yeah. But I guess I, I, I think this is like yeah, I, I associate architect with someone who has a responsibility for the architecture. Typically, people aren't given that easily. So, yeah, you're gonna have to run into like less of that. Like, where do I do my security organization? Mm -hmm. At a company like Google, there's gonna be like a million different data science. And yeah, you can, and uh, uh, along that line, you can also like hop into different roles pretty easily because you have a little bit of touch on each one of them. So, like, if you do want to go deeper into theory or more into practice or you know, switch domains, like those are more like, like if you were only an electrical engineer and that's all you knew from your education and your experience, it's harder to hop roles into a different, transition to a different role. Whereas a data scientist is more nimble in the roles that they can take on because they have more diversity. <laughs> yeah, you can you can definitely. I have resisted the uh, the push into management. I don't know what the consequence of that is, but <laughs> that's a choice. Other questions on career comments or I do not consider that a rambling, a waste of my time or yours. So that was a an intentional sort of diversion. All right, so earlier we talked about um, histograms. This is the, almost the last section, so we're on track to time. So I was talking about the number of choices of bins. Those are reflecting uh, the ease of which your consumers can understand the information. This, there's also mistakes that people can make that either are intentional or because they don't know any better. And I would hopefully lump a lot of these under the didn't know any better, but it has a consequence on the way the story is um, so this is an example of where I take some data and I want to emphasize the difference. And so I set the scale to be not equal to zero down here, right? which is a purely common problem. Because right? when you actually plot it with a zero, you say, like, yes, there is change, but it's almost inconsequential. Unless that somehow matters to you. But... Okay. And the point of me telling you all mistakes is so that you do not make them, unless you intend to. All right. So there's plenty of examples lying around the internet of people making significant mistakes with visualization outcomes. Um, and so this is sort of like a, a warning that it really can happen, whether malicious or accidental, but in some sense it doesn't matter. Right. So did everybody see this? Like this, this is from a TV show, this is from a sports game, and this is from some that was published. So people really do make bad mistakes. All right, so I'll cover this in a little bit more depth in the, the time series class. But um, when I say average, you should ask, which average? And, and this is hopefully a new question, because like, I wasn't exposed to this until a few years ago. If it turns out, which average? There's three different averages. from. So what we're used to typically is this arithmetic mean. That's like taking up a sum of all the different values and then dividing by the number of values you have. That is the arithmetic mean. There's different definitions on, and there's different motivations for why would you use the harmonic and geometric mean. Um, and, there's, and you have to sort of like, when you use these alternative methods, you should be very clear and explicit that I'm not using the normal sense of average. And it, and it is valid to use some of these. So for instance, if you're looking at heart rate, the average heart rate, right, the sort of like naive expectation is it's an average, so I'll use the arithmetic. But since it's a rate, right, beats per minute, I'll have to use that or not. So this is a, another sort of like quick gotcha that people typically aren't even aware of. So the point of this slide is to say, these things exist, know that there are cases when you should use them, and be explicit about the fact that you didn't use what people are expecting. All right. And then my last advertisement before we finish up is that um, I talked about a bunch of math that you probably are familiar with. There's a whole other domain of application that I probably won't talk as much about, which is A-B testing. 
And so you might have heard of this where a website presents their web page to you. And you're like, looks good, right? I'll just use it, blah, blah, blah. Some other customer going to that same domain, different website. And the intention for the business to do this is to figure out which one of those representations of the website is more likely to result in you buying their product. So you are part of an experiment the business is running to maximize their profit. And so they make a bunch of like really minor changes, right? So like, let's say you go to a web page and then the buy button is green, right? Someone else goes to that same web page and the buy button is red, right? If you look at a whole bunch of people going to that same website, right? Which one of them, uh, which one of those page designs results in a higher probability of the people actually making the, the click on the button to buy the product? It's a relatively straightforward concept to sort of like now that you know that it exists, you can apply it to every single element on the web page, <laughs> right? And that would, that would only be reasonable if you have hundreds of thousands of visitors to your website, which Amazon, Microsoft, Google, they all have lots of visitors, right? So they are constantly optimizing the way in which they render their pages to maximize whatever objectives they have. Right? So this all falls under this sort of like general heading of A-B testing. The reason it is present here in the math course section is because um, there are some statistics that you have to be aware of, right? So like if I say, I'm going to look for whether this feature improves the outcome that I'm interested in, and then you run it on 100 customers. Maybe that 100 customer sample size wasn't large enough to be statistically meaningful. And so you have to have some understanding of like, how long should I run the experiment for? How many people visiting my website make a statistically meaningful sample? And like, you know, that sort of question is really complicated when you're tuning all of the different parameters on your website at the same time. And again, this is only usually accessible if you have lots of visitors, because if you only have three, good luck with an A-B test. Question on that. So, oh yeah, <laughs> one, I had an application for this. So, uh, you also get this in email. So like, when a company sends you an email, they typically want you to click on something or read the content. Right? Has anyone got an email like that? Yes, I forget. All right, so, so what? So I could send out, I have this email distribution list, right? The email distribution list has a thousand people on it. And so I split my email distribution list into two lists. One we'll call group A and the other group B, right? And we'll send them almost the same email with either a slightly different wording, slightly different picture, maybe a different link, a little teaser, right? Whatever slight modifications I want to make, and I send the original email and a site modification, those two lists, and then I see which people in which group clicked on the thing that I wanted them to more often. And so you can do A-B testing with email, right? or any, any other sort of like thing where you're sending out content to a bunch of people and you want them to take an action, you can measure their responsiveness. All right, okay. Questions on that? So it's like a whole, <laughs> This is a disclaimer of a thing I'm not covering, but you should be aware of because some of you may end up using this as your uh, as your work rule, right? That's like a common data science sort of application. All right, statistics, yay. All right, I think that's it. All right, so we're gonna take a little bit of time uh, to do a homework. Uh, before I get that, Hector asked uh, about an email that was sent out. There was an email saying like, uh, don't cheat. And Hector's question was, what does that mean? Well, to be to restate what's in the syllabus, the intention there is that um, I have stated that it is okay to talk to other students about the design of your homework. That's acceptable, that's not cheating. If you uh, share code with other students, that is crossing the line into plagiarism. So that's, that's my boundary. Does that answer the question? So sharing code is a naughty. Talking about design, Perfectly acceptable. The, the danger is like if someone's design discussion turns into, well, what about this variable? And that's probably going to cause some issues. Does that answer? Okay. All right, homework time. So I've got two homeworks. There's going to be two notebooks required back for the solution set. So they're separate efforts. Um, the first one is talking about that power source data that I looked at. So there's going to be creating two pictures from that data. And uh, they're both about the power per hour. But 
they're slightly different pictures. One is you're going to have 24 bars because it's 24 hours in a day. And the other is going to have as many bars as you have days of data times 24. And then the other problem is a little bit more complicated to describe. I have two die. This, this is a die, right? So dice, die. All right, so I roll a die, and I get either a one or a two or a three or a five or a six. Uh, one, two, three, four, five or six. That's a fair die. And if I roll a die that maybe is like weighted, like has some little bit of weight in it, it's more likely that one of the outcomes will show up more often. And that's a, a weighted die or a biased die. Right? And so I'm telling you that there is a die that has an unfair outcome. And so my question to you is, if you roll both of those die many times and you record the results, will you be able to distinguish what the outcome of those two die is? OK. <laughs> so I'm either getting a lot of blank stares or everybody's bored by this. So we're going to write down for whichever one of those problems you want um, what it is you're going to do and then how we're going to do it. And there'll be a reading format. So. So then again, this is the homework assignment. We have seven minutes to figure out how are you going to solve those problems. And you, so, why am I doing this in class? It's so that you can ask me questions in front of everyone, so that we can all get the same consistent answer of the obvious things. Right. So, I try to write these somewhat clearly, but I understand that they're not well defined in the, in the usual homework sense. How are you finding ways to evaluate? Yeah. So, uh, if you think back to the coin flip, we sort of assumed that those outcomes would be fair, right? So we didn't we didn't bother assigning the outcome probability of heads versus the outcome probability of tails. So you will need to figure out how to assign an unequal distribution to a set of outcomes. It's a suitable sample size of all roles and bottom. That is a good question that you will have to answer by figuring that out. So so there is so the, the homework doesn't say like do a thousand rolls of each die and that will tell you whether or not the, 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 the dice is fair. But the goal is that you should be able to take any value that a user would provide as an argument to a function as your input. So, so not did that clarify it? It's again, so it's just like the, the generating the random data. Yeah where I don't have an answer, I want to be able to put in that number. And again, these are, uh, they're not simple probably, and so you do have spring break, good news. Happy spring break. <laughs> and I'll be available, I'm not watering away. These aren't next week, probably. There is no class, as far as I know, next week. So yes, that's correct. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, like I think the next class is the 27th, so these will be due on the 26th. Okay. Well, while you're stewing on that, um, there is a reading assignment. It, there is no essay associated with this reading assignment that I'll be grading, so it's just sort of like I highly recommend um, some reading. And then I think, yeah, does anyone have any other questions on the homework before we bust out to the last little interaction? All right. You want to solve it to the No, there's no need to solve the die. They're independent. They have a fair die. No. We'll see the fair die. Mm -hmm. I'll just sum the numbers up. That was fair. So you're, you're, I think you're asking how would you detect that they're not fair? Is that what you're asking? I'm not, I'm not asking that. Okay, so no sums, as far as I understand, would be necessary to solve this problem.
All right. And then the last activity is to find a person that you haven't talked to recently. <laughs> and I think if you default to the person who's next to you, that's like a too easy of an answer. So like. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so you're going to talk to someone about what you're learning class. It's a real challenge. <laughs> We've got three minutes. I know that you can do this in three minutes. <laughs> I'm 